Hello everybody, today we are going to talk about constrictive and restrictive cardiomyopathies, some of the basic concepts um, that will be very important in order to understand this pathophysiology as well as some high yield points for taking any exam. So we have covered some of these features in, in other lectures, but I thought I should just combine them in one short lecture so that we can have side-to-side -side comparison and so that it can stick to the mind. So with that, we come to the picture A here. So this is a typical heart in patients who have restrictive cardiomyopathy. We know there are a variety of things that can cause restrictive cardiomyopathies. I won't go into detail. It can be amyloidosis. Um, it can be hemochromatosis or glycogen storage diseases. But the hallmark feature of restrictive cardiomyopathy, our level is RC, restrictive cardiomyopathy, is that the atria are huge. So the atria are big, and the LV as compared to the atria might be small. So you might get a still frame or a picture of an echocardiographic image where they will show you um, an echo of a, of a heart where the atria will be large and the LV as compared to the atria will be small, which kind of tells you, okay, this is something related to the restrictive cardiomyopathy. The reason for that is the whole heart is very stiff. LV as well as the RV is so stiff that the atria have to do extra work to pump the blood into the stiff left and right ventricle that cause kind of stretches the atria and they become bigger. So it's going to be biatrial enlargement. As compared to if you look at this picture D on the other side, this is the constrictive cardiomyopathy. This yellow lines around the heart, I'm trying to show that this is kind of a pericardium that is thickened leading to constrictive pericarditis. There are a lot of things that can cause constrictive pericarditis. It can be idiopathic can be infectious, um, it can be post-operative patients who get cabbage and then they develop pericarditis, they can, get, they can get this constrictive physiology or constrictive cardiomyopathy. So let's look at the waveforms in the cardiac catheterization lab that can help us distinguish between if it is a constrictive or if it is a restrictive cardiomyopathy. So you will see a lot of patients sent to the cath lab to have this study to define whether they have a constrictive physiology or whether they have a restrictive physiology or cardiomyopathy. So with that, if you look at the picture B here, this is a waveform of restrictive cardiomyopathy. I have labeled this LV waveform not labeled, but I have made it in red color as an the blue waveform is your RV. So if you see these two arrows here going down, this is when a person is going from expiration to inspiration. So what happens in inspiration is there's decreased filling of the right and left ventricle in restrictive cardiomyopathy because of the increase intrathoracic pressure and we also know that the left and the right ventricles are already stiff so they're not able to accommodate a lot of blood coming to that so that the filling is compromised so in this case rv and the lv filling will be compromised so what will happen in this situation is both the rv and the lv filling will go down during inspiration. So basically decreased filling, the RV pressure goes down as well as the LV pressure goes down in the same direction. One thing I want you to notice here is this dip and a plateau. So this is a classic thing we see in patient, and you can see it either in constrictive and restrictive cardiomyopathy. Basically, what's happening is there is a rapid 
dip and a plateau and that is if you remember the cardiac cycle when there is atrial filling if you go back to picture a the atria is being filled with blood and there is high pressure in the atria both right and the left atrium so what they are basically doing is these atria are under so much pressure they're just waiting for these atrioventricular valves to open as soon as the valve open they just dump the blood into the ventricle and that's why you see it is a rapid descent or a rapid filling phase and then you see what what you call like it is a staggered phase this is staggered phase is because now the left and the right ventricle both does not have that compliance to stretch and accommodate the blood so that atria have to kind of stagger or, or work their way to kind of push this blood into the ventricles so it's going to be a prolonged period where the atria will keep pushing the blood into the ventricles and so that you see this square root sign and that is true for the constrictive cardiomyopathy as well so in physiological term we call it as concordance basically the right ventricle filling goes down the left ventricle filling goes down this is a concordant or a concordance waveform hallmark of restrictive cardiomyopathy with that we move to picture d here so here it's a totally different story so basically when a person inspire the decrease in the increase in thoracic pressure but they also cause increased venous return this causes the filling of the atria and more blood goes into the right ventricle if you'd see look at this picture d and picture a here as i said here the atria are not huge this is because they are already encapsulated in a pericardium there might be high pressures but the volume or the atrial enlargement might not be there so anyway so we said inspiration there is increased venous return increased filling of the the right atrium and it causes more filling of the right ventricle here's there's something very important happens and that is as the right ventricle fills it has to accommodate this blood and given this rigid pericardium around the, the right ventricle the right ventricle cannot dilate or expand in this direction the only way the right ventricle can accommodate the extra amount of blood coming through the right atrium is to push the septum interventricular septum towards the left ventricle so now you have this big cavity accommodating that blood that's coming back through the venous circulation but what is it doing is basically pushing the interventricular septum towards the left ventricle and ended up decreasing the left ventricular cavity size so when the left ventricular cavity size decreases there is less filling of the left ventricle so the ao pressures or the lv pressure go down let's see how does that look like in the pressure waveform in the cath lab so let's come to the picture d here so here this blue is your rv waveform and your red is your lv waveform and the patient is going from expiration to inspiration as the patient inspire we said that there is more filling of the right ventricle this arrow is kind of showing this here if you come to this beat here now you see there is more right ventricular filling but look at this other red waveform which is your lv pressures or lv filling as the rv filling goes up lv filling is go going down so this is called the discordant discordant waveform 
So this is all we want to see when we see that when, when we send somebody with suspected constrictive cardiomyopathy to the cath lab to do this pressure waveform and this is called the constrictive restrictive study that we usually label it. So again during exploration on this picture D as the RV filling increases the LV filling goes down or LV pressure goes down and we kind of talked about because of this increased filling of the right ventricle pushing the septum into the left ventricle and compromising the left ventricular cavity. So these are very two important waveforms and they come up all the time not even not only in the exams but in, in, in clinical practice or in the cath lab when we are doing these patients. So with that, we come to another waveform and we'll see picture E here. So this is your JVP. We have covered this in detail in one another, another lecture, but I'll just come here. So A wave, which is an atrial contraction, you have X des descent, you have a C wave, then you have a V wave here that goes up. What I want you to see is this Y wave. And this, in this particular case, in constrictive cardiomyopathy, they call it rapid Y descent. Again, this is kind of what we talked about earlier. That is, the atria, while they are accommodating the blood, their pressure goes up because they are encapsulated in that rigid pericardium. They are just waiting for the valve, atrioventricular valve, to open and dump the blood into the ventricle. So that's when you see this Y descent and classic explanation in the books is called rapid Y descent. So another waveform that they might give you on the exam or you might see in your clinical practice. With this we come to the last point that I want to make. I want you to look at the picture F here and this picture in picture F this is your left left ventricle this is your right ventricle right atrium and the right the left atrium so this is another thing that we can do in the echo lab and what we call like a tissue doppler we can switch the setting on the echo probe and then we can measure the velocities of the myocardium or the tissue doppler what we call them so what I want you to look at this is a red dot here. This is called the lateral mitral annulus. And then in the middle, you have this medial mitral annulus. So when you are doing an ultrasound, you can, with a tissue Doppler, can measure how much of the displacement of this lateral mitral annulus is happening and then you can turn the probe and then you can measure how much of the displacement of the metri of the medial mitral annulus is happening so here if you look at this bar graph this is your lateral mitral annulus in a normal heart there is a lot of movement of the lateral mitral annulus. So it goes up and down every time there is systole and diastole, there is a lot of displacement of the lateral mitral annulus as compared to the meat to the medial mitral annulus, which might not be displaced that much. And that is makes sense because the, the medial structure of the heart is inside the heart of the medial structure of the mitral valve is inside the heart and it is kind of tugged on both sides one side with the mitral valve and other on the other side with the tricuspid valve and, and below is the interventricular septum. So all that, for all these reasons, there is not much displacement of the medial mitral annulus. So this is a normal tissue Doppler on echo imaging that can help us determine and distinguish between constrictive and restrictive cardiomyopathy. So with that, we come to picture G here. So now we understand the normal tissue Doppler in patients looking at their 
lateral and medial lateral and medial mitral annulus so here, here i want you to look at this this is kind of what we call a restrictive cardiomyopathy again the atria are huge left ventricular is small or right ventricular is small so the biventricular you know size is smaller as compared to the biatrial size so here if you look at this lateral mitral annulus and then the medial the medial mitral annulus since the whole pericardium is stiff the compliance has gone down so there is less movement or there's less compliance of these whole myocardial structures so when you do the tissue doppler in these patients this is echo probe with a tissue doppler and what you will see is that as compared to the normal movement of the lateral and medial mitral annulus both of them have gone down so the lateral as well as the medial mitral annulus is not moving that much up and down as compared in picture f or in the normal heart so in this situation as he called about it restrictive cardiomyopathy both the medial and the lateral mitral annulus tissue doppler goes down and with this we come to the last picture which is picture f here and this is kind of what with the constrictive cardiomyopathy and here a very interesting thing happens and in echo board and in echo books they describe it as a analyst paradoxes or reverses like there is the the whole physiology is different as compared to the normal and the restrictive cardiomyopathy so basically now if you look at this medial sorry lateral mitral annulus and the medial mitral annulus everything is flipped so if you look at the lateral mitral annulus here that has gone down the tissue doppler in the constrictive pericarditis the lateral mitral annulus does not move that much but what's happening here is that the medial mitral annulus is displaced more although we know that the medial mitral annulus is the structure inside the heart and usually does not move but in constrictive pericarditis what's happening is the lateral mitral annulus is encapsulated is restricted by this rigid pericardium so it does not it cannot move that much all that can happen it should have should happen inside the heart and that is when the medial mitral annulus is displaced more in constrictive pericarditis a term they call as annulus paradoxus paradoxus kind of the similar thing we talked about when there is more rv filling the free wall the lateral walls don't cannot accommodate the blood because of the constrictive pericardite the pericardium and the only way it can accommodate is to shift the septum Sim similar thing happening right now is when the the heart is contracting the lateral mitral annulus does not move because of the rigid pericardium encapsulating it and then you will see a lot of displacement of the medial mitral annulus a term commonly referred to as analyst paradoxes thank you very much